So we've previously used uh, conventional methods to solve uh, a handful of differential equations. Let me just remind you of what those looked like. So these are previously solved, previously solved differential equations. And we looked particularly in this case at creep compliance, right? And if you remember how we did creep compliance, that looked like um, we had sigma, the stress was equal to zero uh, for all time less than zero. Uh, and uh, sigma was equal to some sigma naught uh, for all uh, time greater than zero, right? And we'd solve problems for uh, uh, a relaxation modulus, right? So relaxation modulus, okay, looked like uh, we had, now just the, the reverse here, uh, strain, or the converse rather, the we had strain equal to zero for all uh, t less than zero, and we had strain being a fixed value epsilon naught for all time greater than t greater than zero, okay? So uh, if you recall those solutions, they were um, a little bit tedious to construct the solutions. And we, we'd like to introduce a method that allows uh, f for more complex viscoelastic models uh, and we, so that we can write general solutions for them. And we'd like them to be in a more compact form. So uh, we want to introduce a method uh, here that, uh, that allows for more complexity so more complexity uh, and a more compact form, a compact form, uh, plus uh, something that we can easily uh, generalize, okay? Because we might want to solve something besides just these two classes of problems. So to do that, we, we introduce um, the Laplace transform, okay? So we introduce the Laplace transform to do this. Okay, the Laplace transform, and I'm just going to abbreviate that in the rest of the lecture just as LT. Um, and we are going to say that the Laplace transform we're going to define as F bar of S. The over bar is going to denote that uh, it's a Laplace transform. So we, didn't, we introduced the Laplace transform F bar S of the function F of T. Okay, f of t, and it's going to be defined as follows. So it's going to say that f bar s is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t times e to the negative st dt. Okay, so that's the Laplace transform. We'll call that equation 1. So let's just look at this. Uh, one feature that is 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 uh, uh, notable. So one feature uh, of equation one is that it's defined only for t greater than or equal to zero. Uh, it's defined uh, from uh, t greater than or equal to zero. Why is that? Well, that's uh, going to be convenient for time dependent uh, for time dependent problems. So it's convenient uh, for uh, time dependent problems, like with the kind we're solving, right? Where time starts at zero and goes from there. Okay. Now you might be be going, well, I don't understand how that's helpful in in solving any of our problems. Why are we doing this? So let's go ahead and. and uh, try to show that rather than just tell you why that is. So to see uh, why this is helpful for our problems, okay, let's go ahead, go ahead and consider the Laplace transform of f dot, so uh, df dt, right? So let's consider the Laplace transform of f dot of t, okay? So let's do that. Well, then we can, if, if f dot uh, of t is, is what we have, then the Laplace transform will be 
f dot bar of s, and we're going to go ahead and just apply equation 1 directly and say that this is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of f dot of t times e to the negative st dt. Let's call that equation 2. All right? So what are we going to do? Well, let's go ahead and integrate this equation by parts. Okay? So integrate by parts. And we find that then this becomes f bar. I already screwed it up. This becomes f dot bar of s is equal to. So integrating by parts, um, this f dot term becomes f of t times e to the negative st evaluated from 0 to infinity minus the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t, right? And then we got to take the derivative of this, which looks like negative s times e to the negative st dt. And let me go ahead and just keep working down. Uh, so if t go, is, goes to infinity, this looks like f evaluated at infinity times e to the negative infinity minus f evaluated at 0 times now e to the 0 is just 1, so we'll just leave that as f of 0. Then I, I look at this integral and I see that it's integrating over time, not over s. So I can pull s out and I have a negative s. Uh, canceling out the negative uh, that I have outside the integral. So this becomes plus s times the integral from 0 to infinity of f of t e to the negative st dt. Okay? Now let's go ahead and call this equation 3. And I want to point out this quantity right here. Well, let's go up to equation 1 and look at it. Well, that is exactly f bar s. So this is f bar s. Okay, so let's go ahead and look now at what these equi what what a uh, little bit of a simplification here. Well, e to the negative infinity is zero, so this term goes to zero, and so we're left with the following. We're left with that f dot bar s is equal to negative f evaluated at zero plus s times f bar of s. Let's call that equation 4. Okay? Well, we can follow the same procedure that we just did. I'm not going to do it here in the lecture, but it's, it's very straightforward. So you say can follow the same procedure um, and show the following. So to show that for other derivatives, let's say we have f double dot bar of s, well that's going to be equal to negative f dot evaluated at 0 minus s times f of 0 plus s squared of f bar s. Okay, we could do a, you can kind of start seeing a pattern emerge if we have f triple dot of s, that's going to be negative f double dot evaluated at 0, minus s times f dot evaluated at 0, minus s squared times f evaluated at 0, plus s cubed times f bar s. Let's call these equations 5 and 6. Okay? So why is this important? Well, if I have a set of differential equations like I have for viscoelasticity, uh, that are that is written now in terms of f f dot f double dot f f triple dot. What you can see is that if I do a Laplace transform on them, I actually am converting this differential equation to an algebraic equation. Okay, so that's that's the reason that we're doing all this and is a key feature of what we're doing. So we observe, okay, uh, that the Laplace transform Laplace transform uh, can uh, transform our differential equations 
I just form the differential equations uh, to algebraic equations. Okay, that's a, a significant simplification. Okay, and, and the reason that it's helpful in this particular case. Okay, one of the um, considerations we're going to face as we try to solve the viscoelastic problems, uh, like we've already solved, is that we're going to have potentially singularities at t equals zero. So let me give you a convention and just say that when f of t uh, or its derivatives, okay, f of t or its derivatives have a singularity, has a singularity at t equals zero, um, like the, the problems that we've looked at, uh, we're going to go ahead and take the value at um, the initial conditions, for the initial conditions, uh, at the, the, the t equals zero minus state. So initial conditions at the t equals zero minus, right, which, which is going to give us presumably zero for all these cases. So what does that mean? That means that likely f will be equal to zero, f dot of zero will be equal to zero, f double dot of zero, you get the idea. It's going to be equal to zero. So what does that mean? Then the equations uh, four through six above, so then equations four through six uh, can be written as follows. Okay. Where we have then f uh, dot s is going to be equal just to s f bar s. Again, this is only true of this uh, sort of we're looking at these creep compliance or the relaxation modulus uh, features. F double dot, these are bar in here, of s is going to be equal to s squared f bar of s. And then f triple dot of s is going to be equal to s cubed f bar s. Right? Let's go ahead and call these equations 7 eight and nine okay okay so we can also extend that and kind of see the pattern and say any nth derivative right any nth derivative uh, can be given as f bar whatever the nth derivative is of s is going to be equal to s to the n times f bar s Again, that's just for the case where the initial conditions are going to be zero. The Laplace transform, by what we've just shown via the, the integration by parts, uh, incorporates any initial conditions that we would have. It just happens to be that in the problems we've looked at thus far, those initial conditions are zero. Okay, so uh, I don't want to uh, state that you know those will always be zero for every problem you'll ever solve, but in the ones that we've looked at thus far, that it has been the case. Okay, so. Okay. Hopefully now you at least see that I can use the Laplace transform to take a, uh, a, a differential equation like we observe in, in uh, most of our viscoelastic problems and convert it into an algebraic equation. So I, let's say I go back and solve for this algebraic equation, which presumably you can do. I'm now left with the problem of, well, now what? How do I get it from the S domain, this, this Laplace transform domain, back to the time domain, which is what I really want, uh, in order to actually write down this, the, the real solution to the problem? Okay, so let's talk about how to do that. It turns out that it's, we're not going to compute that uh, formally. Uh, we'll just say we're going to use a table, but let me, let me give you a, a more formal explanation. So once uh, an equation is solved, the, an algebraic equation uh, is solved for for f bar of s. Then an inverse Laplace transform, inverse Laplace transform, uh, is going to be required to get back to the time domain. So it is required to 
uh, transform the solution back to the time domain. This is a harder problem. So formally, here's how you do it. Um, so formally, uh, the inverse uh, Laplace transform is going to be computed using what's called uh, Mellon's inverse formula. So it's computed uh, via Mellon's inverse formula. And I'll give you that uh, here, which looks like f as a function of t is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi i times the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral of gamma minus i t times gamma plus i t of f bar s e to the s t dt. Okay, oh, sorry, not dt. This is going to be putting it back to the time domain, so this is actually ds. Okay? So that sounds, that looks awful, and hopefully we'd never have to do that in this class, and you won't. Uh, let's, that's formally how you would do it. Practically, this has been done for you. So practically, uh, you're going to use a Laplace transform lookup table. Okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next lecture, give an example of that. Of that. Laplace transform lookup table. Okay, and I'll, you know, I, I've uploaded uh, one of them to the class website, but obviously you could uh, just as just as easily um, uh, look one up on the internet uh, and and download that. So that's how we're going to practically invert uh, the solutions is by using a lookup table for for the um, inverse Laplace transforms. So that is the overview. Um, now we want to actually go ahead uh, in the next lecture and talk about how we're going to apply that um, via, via a simple example problem.